you will. And that bad habit is the one to divide incessantly. So if you had a, a kind of cell that simply produced hormones but knew when to stop dividing, there wouldn't be this problem. Uh, and so we want to understand what it is that gets the cell to that state. And by the way, uh, just by way of illustration, it doesn't matter whether one is studying this at the fundamental level in the intestine or the pancreas or the lung, uh, the, the bronchial tree, because the principles that, that drive cell differentiation and cell behaviors are pretty much similar across all, this whole spectrum uh, of tissues. And that was just to show that the uh, pancreas uh, is no exception. So, so what, is the, uh, what is the real uh, quality of this, uh, of this carcinoid tumor cell. The quality is that it produces hormones, and it therefore belongs to this small group of three cell types, all of which originate from the same intestinal stem cell. And that stem cell produces millions of these cells every day. It's continuously replenishing the loss of cells that occur in our intestinal uh, milieu. Uh, and this is the least common of these cell types. So it's an exceedingly rare cell. And in fact, we have to use special antibody stains to find that cell scattered among all the other uh, differentiated cells in the intestine. And that's just shown here at high magnification. So how might, how might scientists uh, understand uh, what it takes to bring that cell to that final stage of being a hormone-producing intestinal cell? So what scientists do is they try to understand the genetic underpinnings by using a, what is now a fairly commonplace trick in molecular biology, and that is to take a single gene out from a mouse, mouse being the favored laboratory animal. And you can do a trick called genetic knockout, where you specifically delete a single gene and ask what happens in the animal as a result of that single targeted uh, genetic manipulation. And here's a paper from almost a decade ago now, where Huda Zogby's lab down in Texas demonstrated that if you take rid, if you get rid of this one gene, MAF1, you remove all the secretory lineages I showed you in the previous slide, including endocrine cells. So the intestine is now a purely absorptive structure, has no secretory cells, including the target of uh, carcinoid tumors or enteroendocrine cells. And from this kind of experiment, done in many different laboratories over many years, scientists have begun to construct uh, what appears to be a well-validated hierarchy of proteins and genes that are required to get you from the stem cell, the grandparent, if you will, down to this affected child. So this is the, this is the errant teenager that has picked up the bad habits uh, of the parent, as I mentioned earlier. No, what the cells that exist today are the ones that have the properties of those at the bottom, but they have also co-opted the property of the stem cell, which is incessant, uncontrolled division. Okay? So that's the fundamental distinction. These cells normally never divide. They are born, they live for anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, and then they die, and they're replenished by this more disciplined precursor that produces more of them to meet the demand of ongoing cell loss. What the tumor cells show is the properties of these seemingly disciplined and well-behaved, mature, end-stage cells, but they retain the property for continual cell division. And if that, if that were all the property that they had, then it wouldn't be a problem because our surgical colleagues could have fixed all these problems with the with, uh, wheel of the scalpel. The problem is, in addition to that incessant division, these cells have the ability to get out of their home environment, travel elsewhere, and then thrive in that new location. And that is the fundamental problem of cancer that we need to understand if we can attack the disease. Because no other cell is able to travel elsewhere and survive. If there are cells shed from our, from our breasts or our brain or our lung in the course of daily life, those cells have no chance of making it anywhere else. They need their local environment. Cancer cells have the ability to succeed in otherwise hostile spaces.
okay? And that's the, and those are the fundamental properties that we need to understand at the level of genes and proteins if we are going to be able to attack this disease rationally and wisely, okay? So here is a kind of a hierarchy. Now, among endocrine cell types, there are probably more than of any other cell type in the intestine or pancreas. There are literally dozens of different hormone-producing cell types, and that is why patients with carcinoid tumors can have a wide range of symptoms. Some of you or, or your friends or family are accustomed to the flushing sensations, the particular hormone that produces that. But others may have problems with, for example, too much gastrin or too much somatostatin or too much of this gastric intestinal polypeptide, all of which can produce symptoms ranging from profound diarrhea to sweating to early satiety, any of the things that you might have been familiar with uh, from exposure to the disease. Okay? So it's very important for us, we feel, to be able to trace this backwards and understand what are the molecules that make that cell happen, that make that cell be who it is, so that we can then uh, attack that cell specifically and spare all the normal cells in the intestine or elsewhere in the body. So you'll be hearing in a short while from a former protege of mine, uh, or a protege of mine, I suppose, not former protege, uh, Michael Cho is standing in the back. And when Michael joined the laboratory, uh, he made the discovery that this new gene called NKX 6.3, uh, when you look at anywhere in the body, the only place where you find this gene is in the, in the stomach. You actually see a hint of it uh, in the very proximal intestine. And Michael did some very painstaking experiments to demonstrate that this gene is found only in the gastrin-producing cells of the normal intestine in the mouse, and we presume by extension, therefore, in us human beings. So the question that he asked is, is it possible to attack, to, to remove the single gene and define what its consequences might be for the host animal? And the answer is you take this gene out and you virtually eliminate all the gastrin-producing cells in the stomach. This is a, a, a gastrin-producing cell, is a common uh, form of carcinoid tumor, known as gastrinoma. Okay, so now we know that the NKX 6.3 gene is required to produce a gastrin-producing cell. Now, the real dilemma here was that in the same mouse that has no gastrin, or virtually no gastrin, there are a few gastrin-producing cells left behind, the number of somatostatin-producing cells is vastly increased. And what it appears that's happening here, and this is the most exciting part of this, of this uh, observation, is it would appear that there is an, a molecular switch between producing gastrin or producing somatostatin-producing cells. And so the part of this observation that, uh, that gets those of us who study this kind of problem especially excited is because it allows us, in a way, to start tracking these cell lineages backward to try to keep moving back along this. It's almost like rungs on a ladder. And what the NKX 6.3 genetic observation in mice tells us is that here's a rung we can grab onto and build this schema backwards. Immediately following my talk, you'll be hearing from Andy Leiter, who's made a career out of following rungs on the ladder and getting us closer and closer to understanding what is the cell of origin and what are the things that make that cell tick and what are the things that that cell depends upon? Because if we can attack that problem, then we can really uh, begin to treat a carcinoid tumor uh, with, with an intellectual plan as opposed to saying, well, let's try and cut the disease out or radiate it or give it some poisons that we know kill all kinds of cancer cells. The idea is to get to this uh, in a much more rational um, and thoughtful way. So, um, so following this observation, what we've done, and we literally got the data for this experiment in, uh, in the last three days, so I didn't even bother making a slide. It doesn't really matter. The point is uh, that we now have a way to label, to genetically mark uh, clonally, meaning that we can put a gene into the mouse that will now mark forevermore every cell that belongs to this tree the tree that can go into gastrin or somatostatin cells. We produced those, those mice in the laboratory after a year and a half of painstaking effort. And we now have cells in which every, uh, we now have mice in which every cell that can go into a gastrin or somatostatin cell is marked 
uh, with green fluorescent protein. So when we look at those cells under a microscope, the whole animal looks dark or black, but these single cells glow like little dots or little stars in the sky. Now we have a way to track those cells, see how they got there, and see what they do in their next step. And now we can come in with new genetic mutations and ask, uh, what is it that makes this cell be who it is, and can we attack that property so we can now start working our way further back and whittle away at this complex wiring diagram that brings each cell to where it is. Now, what I wanted to really emphasize today is that ultimately any approach to curing carcinoid or any tumor requires an investment along the whole spectrum of research activities ranging from randomized clinical trials that are going to determine whether treatment A is superior or inferior to treatment B. And those are the kinds of uh, research that many of you in the room are the most familiar with because that's what you speak about with your physicians. Your oncologist is telling you, oh, by the way, we now have data that temozolomide is very active in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. I, that's the conclusion of an important study that Dr. Kulke uh, reported a couple of years ago. Now, that's a randomized, or not a randomized, but a, a well-controlled clinical trial, which fits at the, at the tail end of the whole spectrum of, of activities in which many of us work uh, as part of a, of a unified whole. This is the example of our coordinated activities at the, at the Dana-Farber, uh, where we have people in the laboratory who've never seen a patient in their lives, uh, uh, but, but understand the biology and the chemistry of the disease uh, in very profound and sophisticated ways, uh, working with people who make a living taking care of patients with carcinoid tumor, collecting their tumor samples, studying the, the particular properties of individual patient tumors, and then with people who understand and study the genetic basis of the disease. Understand not the genetic in terms of my grandfather or father to a child, but rather the genes that make up the nucleus of a cell, the carcinoid tumor cell, what has happened in those genes to make the cell go so crazily awry. Uh, and so um, what, I, uh, what I'm uh, illustrating here is that the, the real progress occurs at the nexus of all of these activities. And I think what makes uh, a handful of, um, of uh, endocrine tumor specialty centers uh, really an exciting and a, a stimulating place to work uh, is that all these kinds of groups work very closely together. We, we speak to each other. We, we share our results uh, with enthusiasm. Uh, with the idea of understanding the wiring circuits so we can build better treatments and design the most effective clinical trials uh, in managing this disease. So I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions now or uh, if you prefer uh, later. So I think what we're going to do, Ramesh, is we're going to hold all the questions for the end. But I did have one, just one quick question for you. You hinted at the end of your presentation. Could you explain to us all what's meant by the bench to bedside process and, and what really is that? Yeah. So, so bench to bedside is a concept uh, that really uh, embodies the spirit of curiosity uh, in physicians. It's the idea of saying, uh, actually, the, the bench to bedside really begins at the bedside and ends at the bedside with the bench in between. It's the idea of saying, when you see a patient, you are, uh, your, your curiosity is aroused because you see things that shouldn't normally happen. For example, you see patients who are walking around and all of a sudden they start flushing. So the, the curious physician is going to look at that and say, hmm, why is that happening? And the way to address that question is to go into the laboratory and ask, what is it that makes blood vessels dilate? If I can understand what it is that makes blood vessels suddenly open up, then I can try to understand why that is happening in these patients. And therefore, and thereby, how I might prevent or avoid that from happening uh, in these unfortunate people. Uh, so that's the part that takes a, a curious physician from making clinical observations at the bedside to the bench. 
the bench to bedside process is the one where you say, okay, in the laboratory, I can dissect this tumor. I can understand the genetic principles that underlie it. I can understand the biochemistry that is that has gone awry in that cell. Now, I want to figure out how to insert a small molecule into the pocket of that, uh, of that defective protein. Or I want to know how there is a particular protein-protein interaction that the cell completely depends on to divide incessantly. And if I can disrupt that interaction, then I can make a dent in this disease. And that's the bench to bedside part of it. So at the, in the, at the laboratory bench or in the laboratory, you dissect the, the wiring. And then going to the bedside is taking the, the treatment of the small molecule back to the patient and trying to get the desired beneficial effect. Thank you very much. Next, we have Dr. Andrew Leiter, who's a professor of medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. Well, thank you all. Can everybody hear me? Uh, thank you uh, all for coming. Uh, I wanted to uh, reiterate a lot of the themes that you heard about in the last talk, uh, but then throw in a few wrinkles uh, in terms of things our laboratory does. But first, I'd like to say a little bit about a meeting that I and uh, Matt Kolke uh, attended uh, two years ago. It was a summit conference on neuroendocrine tumors at the National Institutes of Health. And I think the real take home message here is that uh, we are really, we really need a lot more basic research to understand this disease. We don't know how to diagnose it. We don't understand the cells. And, and that was a uniform consensus that everybody agreed on, the panel of experts at this meeting. And this is where you come in, and it's very important. Uh, uh, scientific research sponsored by NIH has really been under assault for about the past four to eight years. And the government is spending a lot of money on other things. And I think it's really important as United States citizens who have serious health concerns that, uh, you know, we begin to advocate uh, to get the NIH back to where it was. And I think, again, it's people, uh, American citizens, non-scientists who are going to play a very important role in this. And I hope you all will bear that in mind with time. Uh, anyway, let me get to the next slide here. Uh, this just is a very brief summary of the kind of interest that we have in my laboratory. And, and it's really predicated on the idea that we really don't understand very much about the kind of cells that give rise to carcinoid tumors, much as uh, Dr. Shiftasani uh, mentioned in the prior uh, talk. Our lab is more focused on the differentiation of gastrointestinal endocrine cells. It's something I've worked on for over 20 years. Um, and this is a process where specific genes in each cell as it matures get turned on at the right time and the right place. And eventually, as these cells differentiate and mature, they stop dividing, except those that are going to eventually uh, become cancer cells when something goes wrong. Uh, whereas cancer cells, as, as uh, you might think, have some kind of mutation that allow ongoing uncontrolled cell division. So I've always believed that an important part of understanding the cancer is understanding, first of all, what keeps the normal cell normal. Uh, and that's a lot of what we work on in the laboratory. This is just a schematic diagram, much like what you saw before, of what the development